Hey everyone, with new recovery interviews here on this channel every single week with well over 150 interviews so far, I will admit that sometimes it starts to feel like I've heard it all. But today's guest is different. His recovery approach, part of it, is something that I've never heard of before. He has been using ketamine infusions to treat his long COVID. If you're new here, I'm Raylan, and on this channel, we dive deep into the world of healing from chronic conditions like NECFS and long COVID. Today, I'm really excited to talk to Julian. He's over in Berlin in Germany, and he was so used to feeling anxious his entire life that he started to just normalize it. But then COVID hit, and it seems his system just couldn't handle it anymore. And after seeing countless doctors, Julian found relief and hope through some surprising treatments. I'm so grateful for Julian having the courage to share his story while he is still going through his recovery journey. He does not have all of his answers yet, but he is definitely figuring some things out. So please join me in welcoming Julian. Julian, amazing to get to talk to you today. I'm excited that you're here. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure because you have been, I think, one and a half year ago, the first step of my process, which is still not finished. I'm still on the way, but it's like a hilly thing. But you have been, yeah, the first step on this. And so thank you for having me. Yeah, and we were talking about how it's you know it can be hard when you're watching all these recovery interviews and mm. everyone's doing amazing, and you're thinking you know wow, and you're still kind of in it, you know why isn't it, it can be frustrating? I think. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I, oh, sometimes I forget how hard it is and difficult to 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 find out what the problem is. It's just the first step. It's also a big step, but it's just a first step to to find a solution for your problems. It's a more bigger step, even if you know what the problem is and it's putting sometimes it put me so much under pressure if i see oh everybody is recovering instead of me and everybody's doing well what i'm doing wrong doing i'm not enough and sometimes i think maybe good to hear that it's, it's still tough though it's still tough to to recover even if you know that it's maybe because of your emotional disbalance and that for example, if you get to the diagnosis of depression, yeah, it's just the first step. You still, then you, afterwards, you also have to uh, find ways to recover from depression, which is a harder way than to get a diagnosis. So I think this is the same. So how did this all start for you? Take us back. It all started for me in July 2022, so about two years ago. And I got, yeah, corona second time. So I wasn't scared at all because I hadn't. Corona before, nothing happened, and I got two vaccinations afterwards. So I, I thought, I'm fine. The, the virus can come and nothing will happen. And I very much, I think, how is it for everyone with this condition? I very much stress on work on this time. I had an interview with Brad Pitt, and I was so hyped because I thought, like, oh, now I did it. I'm, it's not so easy to be, go further steps as a journalist and to establish myself in this area. And I thought, now I, I did it. I, I have interviewed with Brad Pitt, and I didn't, slay, uh, didn't sleep for much for some days. I drink so much coffee. I worked all the time. I drink so much cigarettes. And this was the time when I got this disease, corona, and... Then it, it hit me very straight. I couldn't, I couldn't work anymore. I, I couldn't stare on a laptop. There was massive brain fog. I couldn't smell and taste. I remember one night, two weeks after the first day of uh, sim symptoms, I woke up and was freaking out. I was running to the bathroom and wanted to smell my perfume because I thought, now maybe, hopefully, you can smell it now. And I couldn't. And I went back to my to my bed and I remember I was like sitting like this and I thought I had the very deep thought and feeling my life's over it, it, it's game over now it's over and I had the feeling that something will change now in my life and maybe it was a self-fulfilling prophecy but afterwards it happened like this I when I walked I had so much pain I couldn't concentrate anymore I couldn't work and yeah this was the first weeks and I, I went to like everybody to to doctors and this made everything worse for me because they couldn't help me. They they had no idea what happened to me. And this was uh, giving me so much helplessness, anxiety, depression. Yeah, it took months to find out what happened because I was so aggressive to my surrounding, to my friends and family. 
I was refusing so much this psychological aspect of this, this disease. What is funny because I was dealing with depressions since 12 years on and off, but I was, I couldn't accept that this has, a, has something to do with my condition because I thought, no, low COVID is just somatic. It's just somatic. And somehow, yeah, it's a play between somatic and psych probably. And still don't know what it, what is exactly long COVID, but I have just theories or maybe glimpse. What could it be? This is how it happened. And yeah, then I had a hilly development of my disease, like periods where I've been hopeful because I discovered the Gupta program. It was the first time when I realized, ah, wow, okay, it's it's possible to recover. Because I have been in a completely different community before where people always said, no, it's not possible to recover. Uh, your life is over. Everything is shit. And then, then I went to Gupta program and says, oh, he had this and he rec recovered. Then I found your YouTube channel. And this was the first time I had hope for my, for me. And yeah, I just continue. Maybe you to tell if you want, if you want to interrupt me, interrupt me. <laughs> but, but, but because I think it's, it's just. Yeah, there were so many different periods of my process where, for example, for one year ago at last spring, it was better. And I had thought, man, I'm so close to recover. And in summer, I had no hope <laughs> because I, I put my antidepressants off because I thought, okay, if this, if this disease is a disease of repressed emotion, I have to face, address my emotions and put the antidepressants off, which made it making me numb. And when I put the, uh, the antidepressants off, it, everything becomes worse. I was so hopelessness, hopeless. And yeah, then I had this stellate ganglion block because I read some studies from the United States where you get an injection here in the, in the ganglion and afterwards people could smell and taste again immediately because it's shutting the sympathetic nervous system down. And this this is what I tried and it worked out immediately. I could smell and taste for, for a couple of days and was, yeah, it was mind blowing for me that I could smell and taste again. And then, then the hope came back. Then I, I would, I thought, yeah, it's possible. Let's go. Even I had other symptoms still, but even every time when I had stress, and stress could be walking, stress could be running, stress could be work or in conflict. All my symptoms came back. Or drinking coffee, which is a big part, because when I drink coffee, all my symptoms come. And then I got frustrating and everybody builds up and blah, blah. And um, yeah, and afterwards I had this ketamine infusion, which was also a big part to see what is the deep, deep down problem. This is my fear. This is my fear to be alone in this world to die alone i think this is my this is my main part and i uh, somehow i had this feeling when i got uh, corona when i got covid i had this feeling of without knowing exactly i had this feeling of i'm dying now alone and everybody will yeah help me yeah this was the way but i'm still on the way to find out how can i help myself it was a problem before Corona. As I said, I have had mental issues before Corona and I couldn't solve it. My way of dealing with it was avoiding, was doing so much, was doing so much sport to work so much. This was my way, my strategy to, to deal with it. And because I hadn't a, an emotional way of dealing with it. And now I have this long COVID, I have a somatic disease on top, but I still have no answer to, to deal with this deep, deep down trauma, anxiety, depression issue. So, but I'm pretty sure that this long COVID thing is just an image metaphor for a bigger thing. And when I, when I solve this long COVID thing, I have the feeling I'm solving an, an essential part of my life. Something is, which is not fixed or something which is not, which I, I couldn't see. But this is a big issue because it was difficult also before long COVID. And so, yeah, still have no strategy, but try and try, try and error. <laughs> this is, this has been my way so far. It always amazes me how insightful people get 
when they're faced with these sorts of conditions. Like everything you just said was just blowing me away. Like how many people have that level of, do that level of self-reflection and, you know, understanding themselves and their mind and, and how all of these things are coming, or playing into the bigger picture. And I love how you said, when I solve this, I think I'll solve something much bigger. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. it's what many people I've interviewed have said some version of, you know, they had to figure a lot of things out about mm-hmm bigger picture of their lives for, you know, it was an aspect of recovery. It doesn't sound like this way of living was your way before all of this self-reflection, all of this insight, you know, all of this introspection, you know, is this something that happened for you once after COVID? Yeah. Yeah. I had no other choice anymore because even before I was self-reflected because I've been in therapy uh, Mm. since yeah, 12 years on and off. But because of other other issues, I had issues in relationships because I couldn't handle these emotions, this big uh, wish for love or uh, yeah, also excited to, to get refused. But now I had this somatic issue, which giving me the feeling of I'm dying and I couldn't. My way of living was then to see the bigger picture of it but this is just an intellectual thing to see what's the problem and ah, i can this this but i still have problems to feel i can talk about feelings but i still have problems to feel the feelings and i think my way should be to feel the feelings to release the symptoms uh, the stress but i don't know because i'm repressing so much without knowing it it's just deep down it happens automatically. I'm repressing because I'm so fear of this big issue, uh, big, yeah, feelings. But my strategy is then talking about. But it's just a small step of, I think, the whole thing. Yeah. It sounds like you're seeing many components that are going to contribute to this overall puzzle for you. But you had mentioned the ketamine infusions, and I haven't spoken to, to spoken to anyone who has used that approach. So I'd love to hear a bit more about that. How did you even get onto that path? What is it supposed to help with? You know, what benefits did you see? Were they lasting benefits? I, I've i read that this treatment for depression, and it becomes more and more popular that a couple of years before, people thought depression is, yeah, reduced serotonin level. Then they realized maybe serotonin is just a side thing of this, and that's they, what they had, because they tried uh, ketamine and ketamine is going on the glutamate system. And in Germany and some hospitals, it's a valid treatment against depression. And because I had, or yeah, chronic depression, because it's the last call for, it's not the first step of depression treatment, it's, I think, a further step. And because I was dealing with depression in the past, I could get this ketamine. I, would, I wanted to try because I thought, yeah. Let's see what I can get from this psychedelic trips. Because you go to the hospital and they're giving you ketamine in the veins. And then you get psychedelic trips and somebody's sitting next to me, next to you and observing you if something is going wrong, which didn't for me. But yeah, I had this massive and very mind-blowing psychedelic trips where I saw, for example... A black balloon, and I know now the black balloon will take all my anxieties and fears, and and I will, afterwards I will be fine. I've seen this in the psychedelic trips, and I was so scared to give him because I thought, oh, who am I without my my fears? Who am I? It's belonging to me. That's what I thought. But then I I have given this balloon my anxieties, and I was dying in this balloon. But then, it was crazy, I woke up and I could smell and taste again, which was like, for me, like, I know it sounds crazy what I'm telling you now, but this is what happened to me. I woke up and I thought, okay, all my, my fears, which coming from, from the surface or to the surface, to the surface, right? They're coming to the surface or from the surface, surface, coming to the surface, I gave it away and all my symptoms were, were gone for days. And that's why how I realized, okay, maybe my my disease is a very deep, very deep sitting anxiety to life somehow or to die. I don't know. And yeah, but as I said, it didn't last forever. The effect I had relapse after a couple of days where I had stress or I think I was swimming 
And then I realized, oh, my nervous system is still overreacting to this sport. Like the next day I couldn't smell and taste again. I was at uh, eating attacks. Uh, I was, yeah, I was down also mentally. And, but sometimes I'm thinking about this, what I've seen there, that it's possible to address this anxiety and that I have to address this deep fears to recover. But mostly I don't know how this without the ketamine, but I can't take it every day. You know, I can't take every, I can't go every day to doctor and getting this ganglion block. I can't go every day to doctor and getting ketamine. I have to self to solve by myself. I know. And I know that's the way to get more self-confidence, but it's not easy because if you are living with repressed emotions for years, for years, for years, and this has, it has a, it's valid because I, I couldn't handle this emotion. That's why I'm re repressing so much. But now to, yeah, to rebuild my, 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 my brain, to have the feeling I'm safe, it's not easy because I don't have the feeling I'm safe. I ha never had this last 15 years or 12 years. So, but I know what to do. This is, I think this is a good point, but I know it's possible, but I'm still looking for the way to giving myself the feeling of yeah, safety or that I have a safe place in the world. How was it for you? Like, how did you give yourself this, this feeling? What happened that you started to give it to yourself? Like, do you remember? Like, has it been one thing or a partner, <laughs> if, if friends? It's so complex. It really is. And it's interesting because I didn't understand then anywhere near as much as I understand now. Like all of these things you're saying, I did not understand yet. People weren't really talking about these things when I recovered. So some of it I was doing sort of, I don't know, accidentally or doing it because I believed it helped, but I didn't know that it was helping me. But it was, you know, I think we latch on to different things that make us feel safe and okay in control of the illness. A big thing was, was that I moved in with my now husband and I was able to stop working and he just kind of took care of everything. So I got to be in this bubble where all of that sort of stress and anxiety that I had been carrying, trying to get through every day being sick, I got to just let go of it. And then, you know, I started doing all different sorts of things like therapy and meditation and journaling and I had seen that physical activity could help me slowly feel better in small, small amounts. Of course, I got post-exertional malaise like virtually everybody, and it could really lay me out. Um, but I grasped onto that, and I started doing this, you know, sort of exercise program of just one minute a day of just gentle movement. And I don't mm -hmm. think the exercise healed me. I don't think the movement necessarily mm -hmm. healed me, but I it was this... I suddenly felt okay with my symptoms because these little bits of movement would give me little symptom flares, mm -hmm. but then I'd feel better. And then the next week, mm -hmm. one minute of activity wouldn't give me any symptoms, but two minutes would. So I do two minutes, but I was like, okay, this is part of recovery. I'm going to feel worse. And I just felt kind of in control and at peace with all of it. So it's, it's an interesting thing. I was working on brain retraining and working with my nervous system mm -hmm. and working stress and anxiety and all of that, but a lot of the time not even fully understanding what I was doing. Had I had your insights or, you know, the information that we know now, I think I could have approached mm. it differently, done it hopefully potentially faster. Um, but mm. yeah, it was like sort of fumbling around, I think, when I was Yeah, doing yeah. I think it's so difficult because, because for me, just for me, it comes together with another condition, this depression or anxiety condition, which will also have been there before. And so, yeah, it's not easy. It's not about just movement for me, because it's about yeah, feeling safe in this world and feeling yeah. loved. And this, this is what I have to learn to give myself, but I, I didn't find a way the last 10 years. And that's why I get sometimes hopelessness. Uh, hopeless because I think now, okay, I, I couldn't manage it the 10 years before without a somatic condition. And now I have to do it with a somatic condition, which gives yeah. me more and more anxiety. <laughs> and this is sometimes tough for me, but I know that I have to do it because I have no other choice and I really want to do it. I want to get deeper and feeling the feelings. For example, I had a meeting with body therapist and she was just holding me. I was laying down and she was holding me and the feeling of there is somebody who is holding me and gives me so much the symptoms came 
yeah, so much to the surface because I, my nervous system was freaking out and I could smell and taste for seconds again. And that's what I realized, okay, this is, this is a stress re response uh, or a, a response to my body is, or my brain is thinking I'm dead. That's why he's like <gasps> holding all this. And if somebody is holding me and giving me the feeling of you're safe, all the symptoms come up and can go. But yeah, it's still hard. <laughs> Even if I can talk about it, it's still hard to manage this every day by day when I have stress in the job or something. Yeah, I have to do it myself and in the end. Yeah. So how do you, it sounds like, like it is for virtually everybody that this journey is a bit of a roller coaster of highs and lows. So how do you keep you know, feeling hope and how do you keep going and how do you keep motivating yourself to keep working through this with all of those ups. Yeah. Some days I have no hope to say it honest, but I know that I love life so much and that I want so much from life and I have still something to do. And this, and, and I always try to remember how I have been in this moments after the still ganglion block, after the ketamine. And my, my view is when this drug can give me this condition, my also I can do it by myself on my brain. This is what how I imagine my body somehow. Like I think, okay, if this this thing can retake my stress, I also can do it by myself. But I have to find strategies. What is also giving me a hope is my job. I'm still working as a journalist and can write. And this way of getting in contact with things I love, like art or yeah, art <laughs> and yeah, I still want so much from life. I want a child. I want a family. And this is what is keeping me like, and this is what I fight for because I want later say my family to my family. Uh, yeah, this, I had this condition for years, but now I'm, I'm done and I can fully feeling my feelings, which I couldn't for 10 years. And maybe it's a romantic <laughs> dream that I can, the day where, when I feel free of anxieties, but this is what I'm fighting for. So that's why I am keep doing and keeping hope. And sometimes when I have no hope, I go to doctors, which are helping me with this stellar ganglion block. Or... It's funny because last week I hadn't hope. There was a day where I have bad mood and I've been in hospital in Berlin for there's a long COVID ambulance. And I didn't expect anything from there. But when I walked down, I've seen the chief doctor of this ketamine treatment and he was giving me the hand and he said, oh yeah, how are you doing? And I said, not so good. And she said, yeah, you can come again if you want. Like, that was like, I, I realized, oh yeah, every time when I have no hope, every, somebody is covering me in life or, and giving me hope again. And so I'm still, yeah, looking for this moments. I know you've, you seen and heard a lot of recovery stories. I'm curious from your point of view, you know, what do you see as the themes or any kind of the main, yeah, the main themes from, from the people who are recovering and the people who are going through this? I think the, which is very common in the beginning is shock and don't know anything what's going on. And afterwards, like what I also did, <laughs> taking uh, supplements, uh, so much stuff. I also took so much, I still do sometimes taking any supplements and refusing the psychological part of this. And then I think the first realization, which is also common for people and saying, yeah, okay, maybe it's some deep down in my body and in my, in my psyche and I can handle it. I can mention it. So this is the first step and which is very common. What I heard, what I've seen in your recovery stories. And then there are nuances which are different. Like somebody is, going to the mind body therapist, somebody is going, is falling in love, somebody is doing that, but everybody it's all about this repressed emotion, which yeah, coming off and like to deal with it. But yeah, that's what I was seeing in common from everybody. Was so, this a question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think that was uh, very well explained. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what's your, what do you think? What's common in everybody's uh, recovery story? That, the little things that people underestimated most of their life end up, end up being really powerful with their recovery. You know, things, it, of course, that like the mind body connection. Everyone, virtually everyone, seems to 
realize that addressing this is really going to help them. Things like self-compassion, self-care, boundaries, you know, um, even just the little things to support your body, like time in nature, sunlight, sleep, mm-hmm. rest. For some people, it's meditation. For some people, it's time feeding the squirrels. For, you know, it's like you said, different things for different people. Mm-hmm. But the things that they probably didn't want to hear about early on and wouldn't have been so receptive to at the mm-hmm. beginning. Like, no, I've got a very serious physical condition. Don't talk to me about all these other things. In the end, seem to be really powerful in their mm-hmm. recovery. And just the but little thing. Yeah. For me also, it was so hard to imagine that this that my psyche is doing this symptoms. I couldn't, because I had no idea about psycho, psychosomatic medicine. I didn't know how this happened. And I, for example, I met, I met a guy who was kind of blind. He couldn't see anything. He had also red points in his eye face, but the doctors couldn't find anything in, in the eye organ. So then it came out, he was playing games all the time, 30 hours per day before, and maybe his body, probably his body, giving him so much symptoms that he, because he always gets his symptoms when he's looking on the screen. Yeah, mm-hmm. when he's looking on the screen, he got close to blind. He can't see anything anymore. And his body is giving him his symptoms because he wants to protect for him from the screens, which he have been yeah, spending 40 hours a day before. And this was the first, this was mind-blowing for me because, okay, the the brain can do everything. It can make you blind. It can make you deaf. It can make you everything without a serious condition or serious organic condition. And so then so probably my brain can give me this without anything is broken or something. And I know nothing is broken because I have seen it after ketamine, but I don't know how to get this condition fully without drugs. This is, I think, my my work to do now. Yeah, and you make a really good point that these symptoms, these physical symptoms are very real, even if the brain yeah. is causing yeah. them. There are things yeah, that can be really- detected and it does things like oxygen deprivation to cause like muscle yeah. pain. All sorts of very physical yeah. things are happening in the body. Yeah. It's not yeah. just a figment of our imagination. It's just no, understanding no. that connection of the brain's role in initiating symptoms in the body. Yeah, and I, I think those people who are refusing the psychological aspect, they also have the stereotypes about psychosomatic that they think about others. They just imagining the symptoms, and they, they that's why they're refusing this by themselves. But I think we need more compassion for this psychosomatic thing because. It's a real disease, and but it's so complicated and nothing to, to blame. It's a real disease like cancer or something, but everybody who's suffering from a psychosomatic disease also earning compassion for this, like everybody. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If going through something just as real as everybody else and our brains can cure cancer or, you know, they can do all sorts of things in our body. It's our control center. And it is, it does make it a very complicated recovery mm-hmm. for us. It would be simpler mm-hmm. if there were a surgery or a pill that would fix it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a very brave thing, I think, to take, to be open-minded and start working mm-hmm. your way through, um, you know, how, mm-hmm. how can I work with this mind-body connection um, to get past this? Sometimes, sometimes I think I need to completely break out from my daily life because it's very hard in daily life to change my brain to my point of view, my view of of the world. I think sometimes I need a completely different way of viewing the world or view myself. And when I'm stressed in daily life by working or going to doctors or something or meeting old friends, sometimes small steps are different, but most stuff keeps this, the same. And it's why sometimes I think ah, maybe I need to completely break out for three months or four months, six months, or whatever, somewhere else where I'm confronting myself every day and working on this condition and with the hope that afterwards it's, it's gone. Like, what did you say? How much did it take for you to, to recover? A couple of years, right? I forgot, nine, nine years or something? Well, I was sick for 10 years. And when I finally got my recovery, like got serious at the end, it was a year and a half, two years of like all in working hard to get better. Yeah. Well, but I appreciate your 
discipline so much, like 10 years, that's giving me so much hope that people tell me like, oh, I've dealt with this like 10 years, like, because even two years felt for me horrible, like my mm -hmm. my life's over. And there's always hope. And this is telling me, your story is telling me yeah, there's always hope. But yeah, it's still tough in these moments. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's amazing though, because right, because I didn't, I, I think if I understood everything I understood now, it definitely wouldn't have lasted 10 years. I still don't think it's fast. We see some, we do see some fast recoveries, but those are the exception, not the norm. That's, I mm -hmm. think, setting up false expectations for people and recipe for disappointment. Um, but that being said, you know, I've interviewed people who have been really sick for decades you know, but yeah. just now with the information we have are fully recovering and some of them so bad that you think there's no coming back from it. And then they are just good. So yeah, that is the good thing that no matter how long you've been sick or how unwell, how severe it's been, it doesn't seem to be that any of these factors mean that you won't fully get past it. Um, it's just figuring out that puzzle for you because it is a little bit different for everybody, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm always hoping for the mystery of life that can happen tomorrow, for example. Yeah. yeah, that is. And I know that everything can be different tomorrow, next week, next month. But in this moment when I'm hopeless, yeah, I think, no, nothing will change, never. Yeah. But yeah, I have to address this hopelessness every day like and feeling it and not just talking about but. Yeah, talking is first step before feeling. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're clearly doing so much of the work on this, and are just learning so much as you go. And I love that your point. Like, it, you really could just be one insight away, one video away, one book away, one revelation to you know really turn things around for you and just think. You know, you didn't come this far only to come this yeah. far. It would be yeah. a shame yeah. to give up now, even though I know we can't be hopeful and excited and optimistic every moment of every day, but just finding those ways to keep all, like what you mentioned, all those things that keep you going, that's just so important. And I love how you talked about one day looking back on this, like it's something I went through and it is hard to see it, but for a lot of people, this is just one chapter or a few chapters of our life. And then we go yeah. on and all this incredible yeah. stuff waiting for you after so yeah this is uh, <laughs> yeah i just want don't want to talk too much about ketamine stuff but in this ketamine stuff i had i saw it very clear how my life could be i i i, I saw it and it's like oh if this would be my condition forever my life would be crazy like everything is possible like i had just just this this view on my life in this moment but uh, yeah, the shift is too easy for my mind because I got used to it to get in this pessimistic stuff. Like, yeah, I couldn't. Life is shit without smell and taste. What is? Without smell and taste, life is not as good like with, for sure. But I hope that it can happen one day. So thank you so much like for giving me a chance to talk about and if somebody in the comments or have advice for me no anything or just a thought i appreciate everything to go further in this process and yeah i think we can just do it together and um, yeah yeah it is, it is where most people are, are finding their insights and their answers it's just it's from our community it's from each other we've become the experts on this for the most part yeah. so i love that you're open to that still and um, you know so yeah i'm excited to hear people watching what you have to say as well and just show some support um for julian because it's not easy um, to do that <laughs> thank you especially when you're still on it yeah. yeah thank you so much for doing this i would love to have you back one day in the future, we can do a part two. And you could let let us all know. It'd be about nice, yeah. Made, yeah. Let's do an update yeah. down the road. Yeah, yeah. This gives me open, uh, motivation to recover fully and to come back yeah. and tell it everybody, like like Jesus. Oh, but, yes, uh, I have yes. the message for you. But yeah. yeah, absolutely. We will stay in touch, and we will get that that part yeah. going. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for doing this. I also want to send a shout out to Edison Bittencourt. Thank you for joining the channel and supporting the channel. I really appreciate you. Big hugs to you. And to those of you watching, I know this is a lot to take in. I summarize many of the interviews in my weekly emails, just bullet point form, the key things that are working for people. So if you're worried about keeping up, you can subscribe with the link in the video description and get all that delivered straight to you. So yeah, thank you again, Julian. Thank you to those of you watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you got something out of it. And I hope to see you in this next one.